Another study that has recently been done, uh, Carol, or Richard, uh, Bill DeYoung from, I know some of you that work with him at the Higher Education Center, he's at Boston University School of Public Health, um, has just published an article, uh, Case Closed, Research Evidence on the Positive Public Health Impact of the Age 21 Minimum Legal Drinking Age. And Karen Norberg, uh, according to the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, 700 to 1,000 lives saved every year. So we're up to nearly 30,000 lives have been saved as a result of this law. In Norberg, uh, I think it's an underestimate for two reasons. One, it looks only at traffic fatalities and not the other problems that are associated with uh, alcohol misuse by young people. And two, it doesn't take a look at the carryover uh, benefits. Uh, Norberg looked at our two national surveys, the NLAs and the NISARC, uh, conducted a decade apart and compared people who grew up in states where they could drink legally before they were uh, age 21 to those where they had to be 21 in order to drink legally. And they found that those who grew up in states where they could drink legally before 21, as adults, average age in the surveys was 44, as adults, they were significantly more likely to uh, meet criteria for alcohol abuse and dependence and drug abuse and dependence. So there's a carryover benefit of delaying the onset of drinking uh, and, uh, through legal means uh, and benefits that they carry over into uh, adult uh, life. Um, at the time that the drinking age was raised to 21, however, it was still legal for people under the age of 21 to, to drive and have a blood alcohol level that was the same as was permitted for adults. Uh, and remember, I showed you the data that each drink increases the crash risk more for younger drivers and older drivers. So uh, we conducted the first study to uh, evaluate what happened when states adopted the zero tolerance laws that made it illegal for people under 21 to drive after any drinking. We looked at eight states that did so and compared them to eight nearby states that didn't. And what we found was that there was a uh, one-fifth decline in the type of fatal crash most likely to involve alcohol among those uh, young people. I dedicated that article to a young uh, boy that I mentioned a minute ago, Stephen Ross. Uh, Stephen was uh, walking home uh, about a quarter mile from his home in Gloucester, Massachusetts, when a young teenager who had been illegally served alcohol at three different bars in that city crossed the center line and struck him on a bridge and killed him. He was a very popular student, and his classmates uh, organized a, uh, a vigil uh, at uh, the Rotary, just outside of, uh, of Gloucester, on a uh, December night. And um, the next morning, uh, Phil Saltzman, uh, who was a community organizer up in Gloucester, uh, they had a, uh, a grant from SAMHSA, as, as did we, uh, to, uh, we were looking at Worcester, he was looking at Gloucester, uh, to uh, see if community programs could reduce uh, alcohol problems. And Ralph, my community is all abuzz about this. Is there anything we can do that might have an impact beyond our community? I said, well, you know, it was interesting. There was a bill that was in committee for 18 months, that mad report card came out, and suddenly the next day it was out of committee. And they're going to vote on that bill in a, in a couple of weeks. Could you organize some event up in Gloucester, a community event, before the vote is taken? So on a cold Friday night in February, they filled a room with 200 people in Gloucester City Hall. And people came on wheelchairs and uh, crutches, people who've been struck by drinking drivers and underage drinkers. Uh, to testify, they set up, and this is something that you could do with any problem, they set up a policy panel. They got the police chief, the school superintendent, uh, the head of the Alcohol Beverage Control Commission, the student council president, they all sat on a panel and listened to testimony from people about what needed to be done. Um, I remember the last person who, uh, who came up to, up to testify said how proud her husband would, would be to see their son, the student council president, on this panel. Uh, to reduce drinking and driving. But unfortunately, he couldn't be there that night because he'd been struck and killed by a, uh, by a drinking driver. So the next Monday, Senator Antonioni from Lemonster, who was the author of the bill, uh, testified uh, at the Senate in Massachusetts about what he heard at Gloucester City Hall. And he said, let's, let's call this a Stephen Ross bill. And so, so they took a roll call vote, and it was yes, 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 34 times yes and the Stephen Ross bill uh, passed. Uh, then, after we uh, lowered the, uh, the uh, limit for young people, we started working on lowering it for adults and setting the limit at 
uh, 0.08. As I said, if I had, uh, if I had five drinks uh, in a one-hour period, I'd exceed 0.08, 135 pound woman, uh, three drinks or more, uh, more than three drinks would, uh, would do that. Uh, we looked at the first uh, five states that uh, lowered the limit down to 0.08, compared them to nearby states, and found that there was a 16% um, reduction in the proportion of fatal crashes in the states that passed the law, uh, with little change in the states that uh, didn't. And the proportion of fatal uh, crashes with blood alcohol levels of 0.08, we also found there was the same percentage decline with blood alcohol levels of 0.16 or higher. So it, it brought the whole curve down. Um, we thought we were on the way. Uh, we dedicated that article to uh, people from the Webb family. Um, Millie Webb and her husband, Roy, uh, Roy was driving uh, a car that stopped at a red light when a drinking driver with a blood alcohol level of 0.08 failed to stop and struck them behind. Their gasoline tank exploded. Uh, Millie was burned over 60% of her body. Her nephew, Mitch Pewitt, was killed instantly. Her daughter, Lori Lynn, died a few days later in the hospital. Uh, Millie was pregnant at the time, was taken to the hospital. She had over 60 surgeries. Her daughter, Kara, fortunately uh, survived and was born uh, prematurely, but with a condition called retrolental hypoplasia that left her permanently legally blind. So Millie has a horrific story to talk about uh, impairment of people at a blood alcohol level of, of, of 0.08. Uh, President Clinton called on Congress to uh, do the same thing that they had done with the drinking age, uh, to pass legislation that would withhold highway funds if they didn't lower down to 0.08. Uh, and we thought we were on the way, but uh, uh, it's, sometimes it's not so easy. Uh, Norm Scotch was the founder of the Boston University School of Public Health. He was a medical anthropologist. And he used to talk about the fallacy of the empty vessel. And that is that a lot of times people think, if we go out and do research and get studies published, <coughs> that it's like pouring water into an empty vessel. We'll change, we'll change everything. Well, a lot of times there are already contrary beliefs out there. And there certainly are forces who work to perpetuate uh, those contrary beliefs. So it's not just as easy as pouring water into an empty uh, vessel. There are all kinds of uh, beliefs that people had about why we shouldn't have a law. And there was a group called the American Beverage Institute uh, who would sort of follow me around to state legislatures. Uh, every time I would testify, they would be there to testify. They say, 0.08 is a feel-good law. It's not going to reduce alcohol-related traffic deaths. It targets social drinkers, not the high BAC offenders at 0.15 or higher. Remember, my study found that it did lower it from 0.15. MADS prohibitionists, uh, they say that uh, uh, it, it, uh, it, it, impairment begins with the first drink. That just shows that they're neo-prohibitionists and, and want to uh, uh, ruin your, uh, your uh, life, uh, that they're concerned more with raising money than traffic deaths. They said that uh, my study was flawed, that I compared California to Texas. I was trying to pick another big uh, urbanized western state. Uh, they said what we really should have done was compare it to a mythical state of, uh, what was it, Michigan, Ohio, and Pennsylvania. Uh, unless I'm really geographically challenged, isn't that, aren't they farther away from, than Texas is in California? <laughs> they, they said that the, the, the laws would clog the courts with new cases, uh, and this would cost a lot of money. In Minnesota, Minnesota was the last state to do it. They got the real estate dealers, the real estate dealers, to oppose 0.08. Why? It's going to clog, clog the courts, fill up the jails, and, costs more money to keep somebody for a year in jail than it does to pay for a year of tuition in college. Uh, and, and you know where the tax is going to be? It's going to be real estate tax. So they're very clever. They built a coalition. Uh, and you know, if you want to get laws passed, you have to build coalitions too uh, to counter them. They said a 120-pound woman would reach 0.08 after only two drinks. Well, I kind of suspect that they were maybe thinking about a little bit larger drinks than, than most of us would uh, consume. Uh, but in any event, uh, we, we persevered, and ultimately there were 10 studies, multi-state studies, that were, uh, that were conducted that all showed the same thing, uh, that uh, raising the, lowering the limit to 0.08 lowered the alcohol-related uh, traffic fatalities, and ultimately that led Congress to uh, pass, the, uh, pass the legislation. 